Hello, I'm Matt Green, head of school at Falmouth Academy, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2020 Falmouth Academy Community Series, sponsored in part by Woods Hole Foundation. We're excited here at FA to have students back in the building, but things are a little different, and our community series will be a little different as well. Ordinarily, I'd be standing in front of you, greeting you and welcoming you to the Simon Center for the Arts. But as you can see, we're coming to you virtually this evening, but we're nonetheless very excited to be sharing this program with you this year. Tonight you're in for a treat. As, the old, as an old English teacher myself, uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from our own Monica Huff as she interviews Claire Beams, speaks with her about her latest book, and talks a little bit more about the writing process. So sit back and enjoy, and thank you for joining us this evening. Claire Beam's new novel, The Illness Lesson, published in February of 2020 by Doubleday, was named a New York Times Editor's Choice, a Best Book of 2020 by Esquire and Bustle, and a Best Book of February by Time, O Magazine, and Entertainment Weekly. It's been long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize. Her first story collection, We Show What We Have Learned, was published by Lookout Books in 2016 and won the Bard Fiction Prize, was long listed for the Story Prize, and was a Kirkus Best Debut of 2016, as well as a finalist for the Penn Robert W. Bingham Prize, the New York Public Library's Young Lions Fiction Award, and Shirley Jackson Award. She also taught at Falmouth Academy. We're in the Falmouth Academy Library, Claire, welcome. <laughs> From 2006 to 2012. Since then, she and her husband, Finn, have moved to Pittsburgh, and she has had two daughters and two novels that have come out to glowing reviews. Claire, none of this surprises your former students and colleagues who continue to be inspired by you and to be excited to hear about your work. I hope you'll be pleased to know that when we had our opening meetings last week, two teachers used a quotation from the Renaissance Person Tournament as an <laughs> epigraph to their session on planning for a 60 minute class period. They used the, the part about the short wincing feel of a limp period. Um, I know you have a reading from the illness lesson prepared for us. So why don't we begin there and you can tell us a little bit about this book that the New York Times calls astoundingly original. Oh, Monica, you're so wonderful. And it's just so nice to talk to you. Um, and I just wanna say, um, that um, teaching at FA has really been one of the great gifts of my life so far. And it's just the way that the school has continued to support me after I've gone has just been wonderful. So the, the novel is set um, in 1871 at a just founded school for girls. Um, oh, and here it is. So I'll just show you, just so you can all see it. Um, and um, the school has been founded by an aging philosopher named Samuel Hood, who has decided to try for greatness one more time um, by starting the school to show the world that girls can do all the same things that boys can do. Radical notion. Um, his 29-year-old daughter, Caroline, is our main character, um, and she is also teaching at the school, along with David, her father's acolyte, to whom she's finding herself increasingly drawn. So the scene that I'm going to read from um, comes once the school has opened and everything starts to go terribly wrong. Um, so Eliza, one of their students, is proving difficult in various ways and has just fainted mysteriously just before this scene. Um, there's a creepy flock of red birds called trilling hearts that, have, that has descended. Um, and it turns out that David has a wife he failed to mention um, named Sophia. And he has just brought her to the school to teach art. So um, this scene um, comes just after Sophia has arrived and Caroline and Sophia are watching David teach. Okay. In the barn, just before his lesson began, Sophia asked her husband, Duck, aren't you going to sit at the desk? She was close enough to Caroline on the visitor's couch that Caroline was breathing her flowery, humid smell. Duck, Livia said, seizing on this extravagant gift. That's what I've always called him. He just has a ducky sort of look at him sometimes. Sophia's mood seemed to be lifting, perhaps because David was at the front of the room and hers. Please, Sophia, David said. He was trying to seem amused. This was the opposite of his usual act in the time just before his lessons began, when the girls would pepper him with teasing questions and he would feign offense. 
What do you do when class is over, Mr. Moore? Mr. Moore, what's your favorite thing to eat? Do you like mornings or afternoons better? Summer or fall? Blue or green? Walking or riding? Each question a search for a loose piece of skin they could pry up. David knew better than to answer most of the time, but Caroline had seen him as he relished the search. Ducky, Felicity said. Ducky duck, Olivia said. Please, girls. Samuel wouldn't have said it. He would have just stopped it somehow. But Samuel was in his study, reluctant, perhaps, to see any more of Sophia's first full day at Trilling Heart. David took a breath, adjusted his face, and reached into his pocket for his notes. As he drew them out, just at that moment, as if he were pulling a rope, the section of ceiling over the bookshelves gave, with a wet, rotten voice splintering. A cascade of something fell to the ground. Everyone shrieked and gathered around the column of dusty light that now stood in the room, peering up at a patch of blue sky. A cloud drifted. The board sagged, lolled like a tongue. The smell, wet, rich, dark, animal, reached them, and they pulled back, covering their mouths. What happened? It's not even raining, they said. Sophia gestured toward the board's moist, ragged ends and spoke through her fingers. It didn't have to be. Look at the wood. It's amazing it held this long. The brown cascade had heaped at their feet. Like the weave of a basket, it was at first one thing, one dun-colored mass, and then, when the gaze lingered, many small bits of things. Slivers of soft wood, but also loose twigs, grasses, all of it wet-looking, a dirty tuft of reddish-brown feather, pieces of it still together enough to suggest curvings, cuppings, but of several different circumferences. Caroline tried to assemble the mess into one shape in her imagination. A nest, said Felicity, wrinkling her sharp nose. She towed the feather closer even than David to the whole mess despite the smell. Felicity, Caroline sometimes suspected, might have a future as an intrepid explorer of some distant region. A trilling heart nest? I don't know, said David. It's the wrong time of year, but it does look that way. They must have piled all this on the roof and then water accumulated in it, and that's the source of the trouble. Could the others see now that they were being invaded? These birds were not some beautiful romantic happening, some transforming touch to turn life into Samuel's essays. They were strange, savage creatures that carried their inscrutable nature with them and sent it raining down on top of other feebler plans. And could the others smell it? Caroline peered up the ceiling hole into the sky, craning for a piece of what? Whatever landscape the birds had made of their roof. Though somebody would have seen, wouldn't they, if there were much more than this, if this were all, weren't were all or close to all of it? Oh, said Julia, and pulled something from the jumble, touching only the corner. Look, the lace bit I was missing. We told you none of us took it, Lydia said. It's all stained. Julia dangled it so they could see the watery blotch in the middle. Do you think with washing? From within the layer of brown peeked something else, underbelly light. Caroline bent and lifted it. A small bit of freight ribbon, sun and rain boots of faint seafoam color, rough between her fingers with grime. That's mine, said Abigail. I lost it the first week. No, I think it might be mine. I've been missing my blue ribbon for ages, said Tabitha. It isn't blue, though. It's green. I dropped one just like it somewhere, Eliza said. Can I see? asked Rebecca, taking it from Caroline's hand. Really, I think it's mine. My sister gave me a pair of them for my birthday. I've only got one left in my box upstairs. Girls, said Caroline, taking it back. It's only a tiny scrap. It could be anybody's or a tatter of laundry from the next house. Certainly it's good for nothing now anyway. David used his foot to rake the pile toward the corner, as if in this manner the bird's invasion could be reversed when the smell still hung thick with life as the mud at the bottom of the river. He stretched up to push the loose boards back into place, but when he let go, they dropped again. I'll nail it back up for now, he said. I'll just be a moment. I'll have to hammer. This chance to escape a lesson that hadn't been going well was not, perhaps, unwelcome. The door closed behind him, and they all went back to their seats. The shaft of light hovered calmly, like a feature of a holy painting, and in the corner that formless, indecipherable heat. Slowly, the smell dissipated. Slowly, the room began to shift its attention to Sophia. He had long ago done what they all wanted to do, after all, pried up David's skin and gotten to the meat of him. Mrs. Moore, how did you meet Mr. Moore? Livia asked, leaning her chin into her hands. This, Caroline did know how to stop. She could just stand, go to the blackboard, and copy out a prompt for the girls to answer in their notebooks while they waited. In doing so, she would show the girls they were not to ask such questions, and show Sophia she was not to refer to her husband as Ducky in front of their mutual students. 
show her that she had perhaps much to learn here and that Caroline knew it all already. But Caroline also wanted to hear the answer to the question Livia had asked. Oh, when do you meet the people you've known forever, Sophia said. You were childhood sweethearts, Rebecca asked. I was a child anyway, Sophia laughed. What were you wearing when he proposed? My best yellow gown, this was just after church. Every girl in the room was putting herself into that yellow gown and into the space in front of David. Caroline too could feel the sunshine warmth of its fabric under her palms and beneath her own body, warmer still and soft. He told me, you look beautiful, you always do. Would you do me the great honor of being my wife? Sophia's caricature of David's voice made Caroline flinch, all stiff, just like that, like he was reading lines. She laughed again and the sound this time was low and almost secretive. Eliza said, do you think we should be discussing this? Sophia stopped. I mean, it's very interesting, but I wonder if Mr. Moore would like it since he's not here, said Eliza with one of her best smiles. Eliza was paler and thinner than she had been, Caroline thought, the skin of her face tightening and drawing back. The look of suffering was on her like gray light, though since she had fainted, Caroline hadn't caught her suffering at anything. This intercession of Eliza's was, of course, a reprimanding of Caroline, too. He'd think it's fine. Flustered, Sophia waved a hand. I'm allowed to talk about him. But she didn't anymore. As they listened to the clock tick then, waiting for David's return, Caroline glanced, she tried not to glance, at the ribbon she'd put beside her on the couch, which looked, she tried not to think it looked, like one she'd had as a girl, a beautiful spring green ribbon she'd tied at the end of her long braid. Whatever happened to that ribbon? Thrown away or lost somewhere. It had probably not been sitting in the soil of their fields for over a decade, waiting for a beak to pluck and carry it. No reason to look at this scrap and read her name. And what if it were hers? There was no special meaning in that. Only that so many years had passed and the birds had plucked the ribbon straight through those years for some purpose of their own. And here she still was just the same to meet that purpose, to have it done to her. I'll stop there. So to have it done to her, this novel is set in 1871 and addresses the lack of agency and autonomy that women at that time have, but it also feels eerily contemporary. So yeah. tell me about the process. How did you, I wanted to talk in, about how you get ideas for writing in general, but specifically for the illness lesson, where did that come from? Well, so um, the timeliness of the book ended up being a big surprise to me, actually. <laughs> so so I, um, I had a whole draft of this book years before um, some of the sort of more awful and tragic sort of contemporary resonances came to light. So um, I had a draft of this book and I remember driving somewhere and hearing the story about Larry Nasser and the gymnast, for instance. So there's a, there's a treatment um, that happens in this book that is a really awful and sinister treatment. Um, but I think beyond that, many of the sort of roles that the girls have and don't have um, and the ways that they are and aren't taught to understand their place in the world have sort of contemporary resonances too. Um, so I certainly didn't plan any of that. Um, it just sort of, um, and I think some of these things are things that happen over and over and they happen in every time. Um, and so I think that, um, I had certainly never planned to write sort of like a hot button issue book. Um, I really thought that I was writing a sort of Alcadian kind of, um, you know, uh, sort of magical realist historical fiction novel. Um, but um, some, some of the things that I think interested me about these girls sort of fate and their role in the book are things that probably interest me just because of the roles that women continue to have in the world and really always have. Um, so one of the pieces of advice that teachers so often give to students is write what you know. Um, you're one of the most luminous and joyous people I have ever <laughs> met, but your work, much I love it, um, your work reminds me of something Caroline says near the end of the novel, everyone should be allowed that dark, everyone should keep the space of a haunting. Thank you. Um, and I know when you were teaching at Breadloaf, um, you also offered a course on inviting strangeness into your own fiction. It, tell me about that. 
Um, so it was a really important discovery for me, and it was one, um, the strange, I mean, um, and it was a discovery that happened for me after I had finished my time as a graduate student in fiction writing. <laughs> so, so I really, um, I made it all the way through undergrad and all the way through my MFA degree writing these very tightly controlled, kind of careful, realistic stories. Um, and I think that I was approaching the writing of fiction the way I had always approached really sort of every task in my life, which was um, as, as a good student, which I had been. Um, and so I, I kind of wanted to not get things wrong in the writing of fiction. And it turns out um, that you can't, you can't really write good fiction that way. You might not get things wrong, but you're also not going to really achieve any life on the page unless you're sort of risking something. And I think for me, for whatever reason, I think there are various ways to reach that place of risk, but the strange turns out to be very intertwined with that important sort of life-filled, messy, risky place where the whole thing risks toppling over into failure, but also kind of achieves its own life beyond your tight control. Um, so, so I think that's why The Strange matters to me. People are often surprised at sort of the darkness and weirdness of my fiction, of who know me sort of casually. I think especially in the time since I've become a mom, actually. Um, people who know me through you know, knowing me as, as a mom with my kids kind of out and about in the community are sort of, you know, I get a lot of like, oh, do you write children's books? I'm like, no, <laughs> I do not. Please do not allow your children to read my books. So um, I think that, you know, I think there are many levels and layers to any person. Um, and I think that fiction to me, I don't really know what a truly happy novel would look like. Um, I think that novels require conflict and once you have conflict the, the whole thing is probably not going to be puppies and sunshine um and, and some of the sort of more interesting parts of the world to explore in art i think are some of its darker parts so well certainly kirkus reviews caught on to that by calling it a satisfyingly strange novel from the one of a kind themes. Um, another thing that I find fascinating, when you and I taught together ninth grade, you introduced me to Alice Munro, who really hadn't been on my radar screen. And of course, I fell in love. Um, and when we show what we have learned came out, Joyce Carol Oates wrote the cover blurb, which reads, I'm gonna have to read it, a dazzling <laughs> short story as if by a rare sort of magic, Alice Munro and Shirley Jackson had conspired together to imagine a female feminist voice for the 21st century that is wickedly sharp-eyed, wholly unpredictable, and wholly engaging. What's that like? Um, what was getting the blurb like, or what was, yes. oh, what okay. was getting the blurb and being compared to two writers whom I know you really like? I love both of those. Yeah, th I got that blurb. So. Um, the way that that had happened, when, when you publish a book, they make you fill out this thing called the author questionnaire, which is a sort of list of everyone you've ever known in any kind of context. And the very first writing workshop that I ever took um, of any level of any kind was with Joyce Carol Oates as a freshman in college. Um, and that had been really my last substantial interaction with her. I was 18 when I took her writer's workshop. Um, and I um, had never really written, I, I knew that I wanted to write, but I had never really finished a short story before the one that I turned in for her class. Um, all that to say that I was not writing anything good. Um, and there was no reason at all that she should have remembered me, you know, years and years, over a decade later. Um, but, um, you know, my publisher for that story collection, Lookout Books, they were reading through the author question and they're like, oh, Joyce Carol Oates, maybe you should write her an email. <laughs> I wrote maybe one of the more awkward emails of my life in which I basically was like, there is no way you remember me. However, I took a class with you back in, I think it was 2001. Um, and uh, any chance you want to read my book? And, um, and being herself in the, you know, one of, one of the most sort of productive people on the planet, Shirley, um, she, she, took, she said, absolutely. And she read the book in like three days and sent that blurb on Christmas Eve. I think. Um, and I was just, I mean, I was just totally blown away. Um, I think that, you know, the she, there was no, there was nothing in our connection that made, meant that she would have sort of felt obligated to do that or that she would have had to do that in any way. And it was such a generous thing. Um, and yeah, if I could have picked any two names, like plucked them out of the air, those might have been the two I would have picked. Um, I think Alice Monroe is just a genius. Um, and so sneakily weird um, in, in sort of the 
the structures of her stories, which never go where you think they're going to. Um, so yeah, so that it was a very nice, it was a nice moment. <laughs> of your the illness lesson is set in the schools many of your short stories are set in the school how does teaching influence your writing and writing influence your teaching why is the school such a compelling setting for you i think schools are fascinating um, and i think classrooms are fascinating because what they are they're sort of self-contained theaters of human nature in lots of ways i mean you really the way I think of a classroom, it's sort of like the, the self that you occupy within those particular walls may or may not have a lot to do with the self that you are outside of those walls. And, um, and the sort of power dynamics of a classroom are really sort of clear and obvious, but also um, manipulable in fascinating sort of ways. Um, and I also just think in terms of drama and fiction, you're in good shape whenever you have kind of a simplified dramatic space, like a sort of great setting for scenes. Um, and so I just, I find all of that to be just great to play with as a writer. Um, and so, so I think, um, I mean, many of the things that I write about in fiction happening in classrooms are not things that I've directly experienced in classrooms. They're just sort of what if experiments, you know, what if this element changed and what would that do to all these other elements that are all stuck in this space with that other changing element. Um, so, so I think that um, directly I find, I find teaching to be just really interesting to write about. Um, I think it also has to do with the fact that teaching Part of your project when you're teaching is to sort of implement change. You're, you're trying to help people grow. Um, and I think that you're usually in pretty good shape in fiction if something is changing. Um, so, so I think those are sort of direct ways that teaching has, has sort of influenced my writing. I also just think I learned a lot about people um, and about the world in the course of the time that I taught, um, especially taught high school, I think. I mean, I started teaching at FA when I was 24 and I taught there for six years. And those were a big six years of sort of learning to be an adult in the world. Um, and it was just such an amazing place to do it. And I think that all the time stuff is just sort of trickling in, you know, um, and you're kind of learning about people and the ways that they shape each other. Um, and in terms of the way that my writing influences my teaching, I've now taught in a variety of other settings as well, um, college and, um, and various sort of summer residencies. Um, I think that um, when you're teaching writing, it is a really good idea to have tried to write something at some point yourself, just because it's so hard. It's just a really hard thing to do. Um, and the, the better you get at it, um, it doesn't necessarily get easier. The problems just change. And I think that um, the the wrestling with those problems yourself on the page gives you empathy for what your students are trying to do, which I think um, empathy is usually a good thing when you're teaching. <laughs> so, so I think that's that's what I would say. When I was teaching one of your stories, you had left FA, but I still love to teach work, particularly <laughs> to show what we have learned set in a classroom where a teacher literally falls apart. Um, but one of your stories, Hourglass, I had asked you about this symbol of the caterpillar and I thought it was so wonderful. It was squirming in some um, dressing, salad dressing on a plate. And you kind of looked at me and said, that, I, you know, that's not really what I was thinking. I just wanted something that was repulsive. So now that your work is out in the world and in every review, people are finding symbolism and making meaning um, does it ever happen that someone sees something in your work that you didn't intentionally intend? Does that mean it's not there? I mean, I think of as a teacher, the number of times our students say to us, oh, come on, that's too much. Yeah. There's no way they meant that. I know it's like one of the most favorite things that students love to say when you've made them close read something for 40 minutes and they're like, well, sure, but they didn't mean to put all that in there. Um, so I think this goes back to what I was saying about the layers of a person. I think there are layers of a text too. And I think the two, um, it's all the layers of a person that puts all the layers of a text together, if that makes sense. I, I think that um, many layers of our brain are working when we're writing fiction and not all of them are layers over which we have conscious control. So I think that the part of me, especially when I'm first draft writing, the part of me that's in charge is not really the part of me that's like making my lists and planning out what I'm doing for the rest of the day and planning out the tasks that I have to accomplish. I think that was the part I'd put in charge when I was writing the really carefully controlled, dead, realistic stories. 
Um, the part that's in charge when it's going well is a lot closer to the part of you that dreams. And this makes me sound like a much more mystical person than I am. I'm really not. But I do think that um, there are things that happen in a scene on the page that you just couldn't possibly plan because they emerge over the course of the writing. Um, and each variable you change makes sort of opens up a bunch of choices for what might happen next. And any one of those offers sort of branching choices, but you're still sort of haunted by the choices you didn't take and they kind of glimmer through in, in sort of interesting ways. Um, so, so I guess what I would say is that it often happens that someone frames something differently than how I would have framed it or sees something, sees a pattern that maybe I was aware of, but maybe, maybe not in quite the same way that that reader is aware of it. Um, I don't think that means that they're wrong or that, um, or that it's not there. I just think that your, your conscious brain is only a part of what's, what's doing the work. Um, so. I do have to admit, I love the ability to say, I actually know the author, so we can <laughs> ask her. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> Speaking of strange timing, your book came right right before quarantine yeah. and I read it immediately when it came out and I loved it and of course I reread it this past weekend because I knew we'd be talking and I have to admit quarantine had me reading in a different way. Yeah. Um, I paid much more attention to the isolation of the setting to Sophia saying we need more places to go if we can right. for people everything might be more <laughs> And that resonated so much more the second time around. How has that been for you to be in the middle of a book tour and have everything suddenly shut down? Well, I mean, it, it was kind of not great um, in, in sort of practical logistical ways in which I, I had planned this book tour that because I have a seven-year-old and a three-year-old, I had done it in these tiny sort of chunks where I would be away from home for no more than like four days on any leg of this thing. Um, and I really only got to do like one leg of traveling. I was supposed to come to FA. Like I just, I was supposed to do all these really fun things that I was excited about. And really most of those things didn't get to happen. I am really lucky in that the book came out in mid-February. And so I did get to have like a big launch party here in Pittsburgh. And I did get to do one leg of traveling. Um, maybe, I think there were two, two of my little sort of chopped up book tour legs. Um, so, so I think like practically speaking, it wasn't great. And I also just feel like, um, you know, the news has been so saturated with stuff that's not books, you know, for that I think it's been, I think it's been tough for books that have come out during this time. And I think it was much worse for books that came out like March and April um, and even June um, than it was for mine. And none of this is really a problem in the scheme of the problems that we're dealing with, but it's still just sort of sad when you've spent seven years on something and don't get to sort of do its little like entry into the world. Um, I think that in terms of resonances between the book and the sort of, and the moment, these are obviously things I could never have planned. But I do think that again, um, I often, not necessarily consciously, but I often find myself sort of isolating characters in fiction just because um, I think you can, it's a great way of intensifying the pressures on them to kind of isolate them from other maybe sort of mitigating factors in their lives. Um, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying about classrooms in general and the way that those do isolate people away from the rest of their world. Um, and so I think that um, I was doing that for purposes of drama, but I think we've all been living under those sorts of forces now for these past however many months, you know, and just sort of finding out what the world looks like when you're really, your world is just your house and the people in it. And how do you all do? <laughs> you know, it's really, it's something. So. When we met, you had already been working on a novel for years. And I know that novel you recently told a, an interview would not be seen by the light of day. And ever, ever, ever. it's drawer languishing somewhere. Um, what lessons can Inspiring writers learn from that, that you can work for years on something and abandon it. So I hope that's not discouraging to anybody, but that, that's actually far more, more common than, than not, to have at least one novel in a drawer. Um, and I think it's just that you really, um, it's hard to write, and it's hard to write a novel. And, and sometimes you're, you're learning, none of it is wasted work. Um, you're learning all the time and you wouldn't get where you eventually go without those sort of false starts or false, I mean, I completed that. I spent eight years on that book. 
<laughs> so I was writing it and rewriting it the whole time that I was teaching at FA. Um, and it sort of, it overlapped with a lot of the stories that, that did, um, did end up in my first book. Not, not that it shared any direct material with those stories, but just that I was doing other things too. Um, but that novel, um, I learned a lot in writing it. I just didn't learn it in time to save that novel. <laughs> So um, that novel, for instance, um, I had started it as my grad school thesis. So I had started it back when I was still being very, very careful and controlling about everything that I wrote in fiction. I should say that I still am careful and controlling later in the process um, now with my, with my current writing, but I, I tend to try to turn off that like super type A part of my brain until I'm editing, which is the part that I like much better because I understand it better. Um, but um, but so I think that um, that novel, I wrote it in that mode, and it was a family drama. Um, and then I sort of I put it away. And I mean, to be honest, the first three years that I taught at FA, I really didn't have a lot of time or mental energy to write. I I sort of each summer would get it out and kind of tinker with it a little bit. Um, and then um, sort of once I got my sort of feet under me as a teacher, I had a little bit more time and I just kept sort of endlessly revising it. And meanwhile, I was writing these short stories that were getting weirder and weirder. Um, and so I kept trying to sort of pull that novel with me into my new territory, my new sort of stranger world as a writer. And it just, um, it got better. Um, but I think just really kind of baked into its sort of DNA was was its identity as this like the kind of book where like people have a tense dinner and something's really wrong but no one's gonna say what it is you know and then somebody like very tensely like passes the potatoes and then the scene is over you know <laughs> like something's wrong but you're not gonna learn very much about what it is um and I I love many books that could be described that way it's just that mine didn't really have a lot of life I just love that, you know, you have these two recent books that have these glowing reviews, and yet it's heartening to know that it, it's not all like that. There are going to be some things that don't work, which leads me into Miles Pearson. In, <laughs> in the illness lesson, you've created this character, um, and each of the chapter begins with this epigraph from a novel, a fictional novel that Miles has written called The Darkened Glass. And the book, while wildly popular and endured by all the young girls in the no in your novel, it's just bad writing. That so was it fun to write those passages? So um, it was so much fun that actually I made like a craft error early on in the writing where I gave big, big passages to the darkening glass at the start of each chapter just because I was having so much fun writing a bad gothic novel. Um, it turns out, and I also just love books within books. I always have. I've loved like, as a reader, I love that, like sort of getting to piece together little bits of a puzzle yourself. Um, but I just, I, I was, it was so much fun once I got into sort of the, the dark gothic bad groove to just sort of write scenes of just over the top melodrama. Um, it turns out they don't make for very good reading, even if they were fun <laughs> to write. And so I found like, as soon as I started reading through the draft of what I had written, I was like, no one's gonna read these, they're gonna skip them. So I just sort of distilled. And I also realized that you do not, as the reader need to be able to follow the plot of The Darkening Glass at all. You really just need to get the flavor of it. Um, and so I sort of distilled each of those long things I had done into just like the very most over the top awful gesture that I could kind of do that would have some sort of thematic connection to the chapter. Um, and I think it's better for the book, but yes, I was, I just loved doing that part. Well, and I do think, you know, the, the character of Louisa, who's a fictionalized version of our main character, Caroline's mother, yeah. um, the silence of women plays such a part in, in this novel. The women end up defined by the men around them who insist on speaking for them or even silence them when they try to speak. Louisa is very beautiful, but she doesn't say much. And you right. even have <laughs> that passage. Even the essay that Caroline writes for the newspaper doesn't appear with her name on it. She's just the daughter of Samuel Hood. Um, and it reminds me of an essay you wrote called How the Women Became Little um, about Bronson Alcott and Elizabeth Palmer Peabody. And it, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody is so impressive but she's talking about self-conquering and she's making herself so small. Yep. Tell me I, more about that. This book must have required a great deal of research. It did, although I did it in kind of scattered. Um, I wrote this book, I started this book when I was pregnant with my older daughter. Um, and I, so I wrote it entirely as a young 
preg young and or pregnant parent. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, I was very careful. I love research, but I, um, research is so much easier for me than writing that I have definitely the capacity to lose years researching and never actually write anything. So I tried very hard to forge ahead until I just absolutely couldn't and then fill in the gaps research wise. I also think that by being the kind of writer who like in invents a weird species of red bird, like I do get a certain amount of leeway that I've just insisted on by by sort of making the world so strange of the book. Um, but so um, I think that that idea of sort of self-conquering, that's the whole problem with their school, right? They have all these beautiful, noble ideas for what girls can do, but they care more about those ideas than they do about the girls. And they have decided what, what the girls' best selves should be. Um, and, and so, and I think that that idea I, I love Little Women, um, but if you go back and reread it, that idea is all over that book. Um, that that Joe is always sort of failing to control herself and sort of failing to be her own best self, which is what her father tells her it is, really. And her mother, but often kind of speaking for the moral authority of her father. Um, and, and I think that that was very much true of Louisa May Alcott, too, in terms of um, there's there's a lot of you read about Bronson Alcott and Louisa May Alcott, there's a lot, especially in her early childhood, um, he really thought that her older sister was just a much better child morally. And that, you know, Louisa was just very problematic and would have to be like very carefully crafted as a person so that she didn't overstep. Um, and so I think that the contradiction of that is, is really where I wanted to write, um, what I wanted to explore in, in this writing was just sort of what does it mean if you're telling people beautiful things about themselves, but ultimately you want them to trust what you're saying above their own ideas. Um, and I think that that's, that's where the girls and that's where Caroline too in this book sort of become trapped for, for a stretch of time. Well, you certainly have used your voice as a writer to be really supportive of other writers. I mean, your Twitter feed is just one book after another that you admire and you want people to read. And that kind of generosity is what you brought to all six of your years at Falmouth Academy, which is why so many of us are still so interested in everything you do. What are you working on now? I have about, well, so I should first of all say that I think FA, like that, that for me is what the school is in my mind is just a place of radical generosity. I mean, I think of what people there did for me in the time that I was there. I just think I couldn't have picked a better place to kind of learn to be the kind of adult that I want to be in the world. It just really, um, it was an amazing thing to get to teach there. Um, so um, what I'm working on now, I have about 100 pages of a new novel like thing. Um, and it's, it's, it's staying in sort of a space of weird medical treatments, um, but it's sort of, um, it's exploring a treatment um, for, for pregnancy and in particular sort of women who were experiencing fetal loss. It's based on, similarly to this book, I took a sort of real historical seed and then, then and, and, and um, I'm then sort of stretching it into stranger directions than reality sort of took it in. Um, so I have a sort of um, husband and wife doctor team who are trying out this experimental treatment on um, a bunch of pregnant patients. Um, and it's all, it's sort of, there's a, there's a garden in it um, that's sort of, it's sort of loosely inspired by the secret garden, but for grownups. So there's a creepy garden. Um, and that's, that's sort of about as far as I've gotten thus far. <laughs> well, I can't wait. And it has been such a pleasure to have this conversation. But I'm going to quote you back to yourself. In one of your short stories, Renaissance Person Tournament, again, you write, teachers are used to having captive audiences and it makes <laughs> us bad at conversation. That is not true of you. Thank you so much. It's Thank not true of you either. <laughs> Thank you so much, Monica. This was such a joy. This Thank you. It was really fun. And I can't wait for the, the next Claire Beams. Hopefully I can finish it. One of these, you know, hopefully I'll get some childcare back and I can actually do it. <laughs>